uh, the this digital oligarchy that I think is is coming about. Speaking of Google, this digital oligarchy. Um, I believe censorship is probably going to get worse under Joe Biden. Uh, than than it was under Trump. Now I'm not saying that people that incite violence don't shouldn't be censored because they likely should uh, because they're inciting violence that does not get protected uh, by uh, free speech. Right when you incite violence, that's not protected under free speech. But just to have conservative thoughts, um, you know, a as much as I don't like those viewpoints and those ideologies. Censoring them is going to create a bad um, precedent. It creates a bad precedent. Uh, so championing the fact that Parler and some of these more right-wing uh, Twitters and, and even Trump's Twitter, I, I know I talked about this uh, a, maybe a week or two ago, is is not great. I don't think we should be championing it. Am I? I am I kind of excited that like I don't have to hear liberals talking about what Trump tweeted to me a little bit. Yeah, I'll be honest. When it when it comes to people taking Trump's Twitter as fucking news, um, and now that we don't have to do that, I'm a little excited about that. But I think uh, if we if we as a society have enough willpower, we could just ignore that Twitter. Like, think of how how much better the last four years would have been if every liberal decided uh, that we're, that they're going to block Trump from Twitter. That feature does exist, right? Like that feature. If if instead of Trump getting deplatformed, if it was just a mass blocking campaign, <laughs> and like I don't know, a couple hundred million people on a global scale blocked one fucking account, how fucking funny would that have been? He would have been so pissed. And I think a lot of us would have been relieved because we wouldn't have to hear his fucking tweets as if they were headlines, as if they were actual fucking journalism. Trump Trump's Twitter was considered more journalistic than Julian Assange, who's never had to retract a story before. What the fuck? <laughs> But here's the thing. It, it, I, I think that there is a narrow definition of violence when it comes to inciting violence, right? Again, not for inciting violence. That's not protected speech. If you call for uh, a, a, a violent insurrection of sorts, yes, that goes against uh, the protections of free speech. If you call for violence against a certain group of people, that goes against free speech. But But that's a very narrow definition of violence, isn't it? People who call for wars, they champion for wars. Wars are violence. If you call for a war, that's 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 inciting violence. If you deny health care, if you deny social programs and you and you affect people's lives that way, that's inciting violence. You're ruining somebody's life. They get sick and the only thing and they have to make a choice between between staying sick and possibly dying, which is now going to leave their family emotionally shattered, but then also financially shattered because they have to pay for whatever funeral costs that's to that has to be or just garner thousands, thousands, thousands of dollars of medical debt. What kind of fucking choice is that? That's violence. It's a very narrow definition. Economic sanctions promote violence. You're basically putting a country. You're you're not allowing a country to get the money that it that that it's earned, that it's needed to help its people. That's violence. So anybody perpetrating economic sanctions should be considered uh, as someone that incites violence. But all these people get to stay on these platforms, and they get to say that we should bomb these countries, that we should put economic sanctions on Venezuela and Iran. Fuck their people. You know. Those people get to be on there. Again, the point is that I think there's a hypocritical and very narrow view of, of what violence is. Now, before I go to this next part, I do want to point out that it's not just people that are inciting violence that are being taken off of these platforms, right? Uh, Ron Paul got taken off. Uh, let me see. There's a couple other people. I just want to find the right paragraph for you guys 
from this article here, or I might also not be on the right article because I read a bunch of shit uh, that was talking about. Okay, here we go. Uh, I did find the right one. This is from Do Dissidents. Um, Brendan Straka, architect of walkaway campaign aimed at convincing people to leave the Democratic Party, tweeted on Friday that Facebook has erased all his content, including hundreds and thousands of his followers, uh, testimonial videos, and banned him and his entire uh, team from their platform. Walking away from the Democratic Party, which is something that I've suggested to people when they're like, oh, what do we do? We're, we're disillusioned with the party and we don't know what to do. And I was like, D don't register for the Democratic Party. Re-register yourself as an independent or a green or non-affiliated. That's what I, I, re I went non-affiliated because right now there's no political party that's that I can register to in the state of Pennsylvania that I wholeheartedly believe is going to be good for people that represents my viewpoints. Um, if the Socialist Alternative Party or, or the People's Party winds up being on the fucking uh, ballot for registration, I'm all in. I would fucking register as one of those in a heartbeat. But just to say that, hey, if you if this party doesn't represent what you're saying, walk away from them means that Facebook erases all of your shit. That's not good. That's that's Facebook getting to control who gets to say what. And and again, under Biden, if this is it, like this is something that that can happen to a bunch of other people that say, yeah, the Democratic Party isn't the party of the people, which is an objective fact. Reading on, Ron Paul was temporarily blocked from Facebook for managing his own page. According to Paul, Facebook went only as far as to notify him of his page's repeated going against their community standards, offering no further explanation of why disciplinary action was being taken against him. They've done this so many times. I got my entire podcast, like six years worth of work last year, almost a year to the state. Uh, I believe like early March, this is gone, deleted by Spotify. No explanation as to why they gave me some copyright claim. I tried to figure out what to do to, to correct the claim yeah, and all this other, like, where's the claim coming from? Is it the music? Is it, is it a clip I used? What's going on? And the last podcast I posted was about Tulsi Gabbard deserving to be on the Democratic debate stage. Which, you know, I still believe she should have been a part of the debates. Uh, especially towards the end, because she had made all the fucking numbers. Uh, and she wasn't told by Obama to drop out. Um, but I got to, all of it got deleted. They gave me a copyright claim. The day I put up the podcast, the day I put up the podcast, I get a copyright claim. I try to get a hold of them. Nothing. Two days later, the entire podcast is deleted. No, no reasoning, no, you know, explanation of what happened and how I can correct it. That's going to happen again. So let's say there's a candidate that you think deserves to be on the debate stage. Let's say you, you want the Green Party to be a part of the debate stage. And you make a video about it or you post about it on Facebook and Facebook, which is being supported by the Democratic Party. Looks at that and says, well, that is dangerous. And we don't think that uh, we don't think that should be uh, allowed on our platform because we're a private company. And they use that as a red herring. And they boot a bunch of people off of Facebook. This happened two or three years ago. I mentioned this again. I'm going to mention it again now. Uh, 800 independent journalists or uh, organizations just completely wiped off of Facebook and Twitter at the same time. And the only thing that corporate media was talking about is uh, some fucking CNN reporter got his press pass revoked because he would get into argument with Trump. What's his fucking name? Leave a comment if you remember his name. Jim Acosta. That's it. Acosta getting his press pass revoked was like this huge big deal, but Twitter and Facebook getting rid of 800 independent news organizations' uh, accounts. No big whoop. Now, here's what I see. This is going to be, I'm going to draw a parallel here. 
in the 1910s, uh, very early 1900, you had you had uh, socialists and anti-war protesters being targeted and sent to prison under the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act, which was uh, written and put forward and championed by a, a Democratic president named Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was a racist. He was a warmonger. He hated socialists more than anything. Uh, and he was supported by bankers. He also supported America getting involved in World War I. Why? Because it would be very good for the Fed, which he also instated. Because the Fed would then be able to profit off of both sides, which they did. There's a lot of similarities between Joe Biden and Woodrow Wilson. Uh, presidents that are, uh, you know, 100 years apart from each other, a little, little under 100 years apart from each other. Both of them are racists. Both of them hate socialism. Uh, they voted for wars. They are super friendly with bankers. Uh, he, they hate criticism of anything that they do at all times. If you criticize Joe Biden, he gets pissed off at you. If you criticize Woodrow Wilson, same thing, right? He would get mad. Uh, he, they wrote authoritarian bills. Joe Biden was one of the architects of the Patriot Act. And now we're seeing uh, that get uh, brought back up again. Um, and all these authoritarian bills strip peoples of their rights under the guise of national security. So the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act basically said when we're in, engaged in an act of war, you can't you can't be an anti-war activist. You can't be a socialist against war. You can't talk about how the working class are being sent to the slaughter just so rich people can make more money. You can't say things like that when we're in an act of war. It's a matter of national security. What is, and isn't that basically what happened with the Patriot Act? A bunch of our rights were stripped. Oh, you can't be against the American military because we're, we have a war on terror happening right now. Oh, if you if you say that the if you say that this is a bad idea, then the terrorists win. How many times did you guys hear that? I was 13, 14, I think, in 2001. I was I was young. I was a young kid um, in seventh grade or something. And. I st I never understood that whole like if you if you criticize the military in any way shape or form you're anti-American. So with that in mind, right? We just gave this little comparison of of this very authoritarian president Woodrow Wilson in comparison to Joe Biden. What what is stopping Joe Biden? from saying some similar things. I mean, the Espionage Act is still in place. It's what we're using against Julian Assange. It's what we're using against uh, any whistleblower that comes out. What is to stop Joe Biden from saying if you're, oh, you can't criticize, uh, you can't criticize the, the Democratic Party because if you do that, then then it means that you're, you're, you're this anti-government insurrectionist. And, you know, this language might incite violence and we have to stop that from happening. Oh, you can't criticize me. You can't bring up my record because that just fuels the opposition. It, 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 it helps out the domestic terror problems. Oh, if you're a socialist, then you do, then you want to overthrow capitalism, which means you're against the American government. What's to, what's to stop him to, from from making stretches like that? What's to stop Facebook from making determinations like that if we're going to give them that much power or Twitter or any of these other things? So the question then becomes, what, what do we do? What the fuck do we do about all this? If I can find the, the right page. Oh, my God. I have a very old notebook. <laughs> and, I, and I think it got wet at some point. So all the pages are all like crinkled and stuck together. So sorry about that. Um. A big tech and, and the ISPs are going to be on board with if if Biden decides to to uh, enact this level of censorship, right? Because I do think that it'll start with conservatives. I do think that it'll start with anybody remotely right wing or 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 just anti democratic party. Those those will be the two camps that'll uh, get hit first, and we're already kind of seeing that happen, right? With with somebody part of the walk away campaign and and what happened to Ron Paul. 
And they're going to love it because here's the thing. What did Biden do? What was the first thing he did when, when he got nominated? He went and gave a fucking speech to Comcast. He did a Comcast speech. They love him. They're, they're all fucking best friends with him. So, I mean, they're going to they're gonna go along with this. They're going to go along with them saying, okay, yeah, we'll censor anybody that's anti-democratic party. And we'll frame them under this, you know, national security guise. Now, what what's what what can we do, right? So a bunch of people are going to leave the platform, but Facebook and Twitter, I mean, those are global platforms. So it's you know, billions of people are on there. So if a couple hundred thousand or a couple, even even a few million people leave the platform to go to these alternative um, alternative platforms. It's not going to impact them enough. But what it does do, like platforms like Minds.com, Rockfin, things of that sort, uh, the, and those are two platforms that I am on and I endorse uh, quite a bit, is, uh, you know, it, it, it ends up being polarized. You get the far lefties and you get the far right people. So it ends up being this polarized uh, platform. But more importantly, why don't why don't people... Uh, you know, how do I, so, so there's, I, I think there's like an evolution to get to this point of, uh, 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 of like supporting alternative media, realizing that the duopoly is, is full of shit and that you have to do something about it and you can't support these candidates over and over again. Like there's, there is a list of things that you have to go through. Uh, like I, when I was in, in, uh, high school and in college, I knew that Fox news was a bunch of trash and I would listen to MSNBC and NPR. And I thought those were like good, you know, uh, for the people type of journalist, journalistic out, uh, outlets. And then once you once I kind of got out of college, I started to learn the MSNBC and CNN. They're all corporate controlled. And then I learned that NPR was more corporate controlled. And I veered into these other, um, you know, more independent journalistic organizations that aren't aren't being paid by. Uh, by by Pfizer or by Raytheon or by any of these other corporations, right? Uh, and I learned that these people don't have an agenda. They're just trying to get the truth out there to people. So I started supporting things like Consortium News, Mint Press News, uh, The Gray Zone, The Intercept. Um, and even The Intercept right now is 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 on murky grounds. Uh, you know, I supported people like Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi, all these folks. So I think there's there, there's this, you know evolution that needs to happen of you kind of need to see the media for what it is. Um, and I think there are some people that haven't seen the media for what it is. So they're still stuck in, in being completely fine. They're the people that kind of champion the fact that right wingers are being deplatformed. Um, and again, I'm not a fan of fucking racist ideology. I'm not a fan of hearing uh, racial epithets and, and white supremacists, but I know I want to know what they're saying. So I know how to defend myself against them. Uh, not, not in, in a in a violent sense or anything, but know what their arguments are and where their arguments are coming from so I can construct an actual debate and, and have civil discourse with them. Um, so, you know, those folks end up staying on these platforms, which gives credibility to platforms like Facebook and Twitter. To them, by taking off these these oppositional voices that they don't have to see and engage with in any way, shape, or form, is good because it creates this bubble and it creates this this nicey little world that's that's manufactured by Facebook and Twitter. There's no challenge, there's no edge, there's no civil discourse, and really, it's 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 not intellectual either. Um, you know, so those people take credibility away from things like Minds.com, from things like Rockfin, and and credibility is is made up. It's a made up thing. Right. You give credibility to whatever you feel is, quote unquote, credible. There are people that don't think that I'm credible at all. I mean, I ha I've, I've had people that, that have basically come out and questioned me because because I challenged the Democratic Party. Whether I'm a Trump supporter and then and then they feel credible enough to say that I am a Trump supporter. When that's 
couldn't be furthest from the truth. And then they discredit everything I say based on the fact that they've concluded that I'm a Trump supporter. So that credibility is made up. It's manufactured. So if everybody decides, you know, yeah, okay, we're not going to give Facebook any more credibility. We're going to go join some of these alternative social media groups and, and uh, you know, practice free speech. And here's the thing. Let's say you go on Minds.com, you find 30 people that you want to follow, and out of those 30 people, five of them uh, start going down this weird rabbit hole of conspiracies and and say something mildly racist. And you go, what the fuck? This is, this is ridiculous. Instead of trying to be like, well, these people need to be deplatformed, you can, you can do a couple things. You can voice your opinion and say, hey, uh, you know, I followed your channel because you were talking about X, Y, Z, and and you made these statements about this particular group of people that was mildly racist, and and you're kind of peddling some conspiracy theories. Um, I I don't feel like I can trust you anymore, and so I'm going to stop watching you, and then you stop watching them, right? Likelihood of them changing their viewpoints is is slim to none. Um, Unless a bunch of people leave, and even then, there's a there's a likelihood that they won't change, because the psychology of the person is, oh well, I'm uh, how can I'm I'm the one that's right. Oh, I'm just being ostracized. They victimize themselves, and they double down in what they believe in. Just don't watch the shit. That, I mean, I have people like that all the time. They get mad at the shit that I say. And it's like, wait a minute. If you disagree with me that vehemently, what is the point of you trying to trash me and uh, make fun of me and say all these awful things? I don't see the point in it. And I, and I don't participate in that sort of stuff, right? I don't, I don't participate in the snarky bullshit uh, or the name calling or any of that sort of stuff. So when that kind of starts, I deadpan them. Um, and usually, eventually, I'll catch them in their own hypocrisy because I'm deadpanning them and not engaging in their in their thing. But don't pay attention to my stuff. You're an adult. You have free will. You have willpower. Engage in that willpower. I don't like Alex Jones. Did I listen to three of the five hours of the Alex Jones and Joe Rogan podcast? Absolutely. But I didn't have to. Nobody was forcing me to. I was curious. And my curiosity was satiated. I, I put myself through a little bit of intellectual hell for just a little bit longer. And then I fucking stopped listening to it. And I don't listen to Alex Jones anymore. That is a choice that I make. David Pakman. There's another one. I used to listen to David Pakman. And then he went down the neoliberal side of things. I no longer listen to, listen to David Pakman. I don't go on David Pakman's channel and trash him and try to say that you're you're a bad corporatist piece of shit whore or what have you. I'm not good at the you know the trolley insult shit. Credibility is made up. It's a made up metric. You know, like that's what some people tell me when I tell them to switch to minds.com or or go over to Rockfin is it you know oh well those sites oh there's not enough people well yeah how many people do you think were on facebook and youtube when they first came out myspace just started with a fucking guy in a it, you know a white white t-shirt i know ron has talked about how uh we fucked up myspace and we totally did um although <laughs> I, I wrote some pretty dramatic essays. Let's call them dramatic uh, for the sake of the argument. I wrote some pretty dramatic essays after I bombed at a show. <laughs> uh, I wrote a very dramatic essay on MySpace. And and uh, I, I think I'm glad that that's not gone anymore. <laughs> that's, that's gone forever now. Look, uh... Minds, Rockfin, whatever other alternative media sources out there, they're just as credible as Facebook and Twitter and stuff. Uh, people will bring up antitrust laws uh, to to say that antitrust laws will prevent Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that to 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 getting out of hand. But uh, you know, yes, antitrust laws were put into place to protect people from corporations. But I mean, how many people? are actually being protected for having viewpoints that differ from public consensus. 
where where were these antitrust protections when those 800 independent journalistic organizations were taken down without warning and just given a bland you violated community standards message where were where was those antitrust laws for for Ron Paul or Brandon Straka you know you can say that these antitrust laws exist and they sure as hell do but they're not they're not but they're not being implemented. They're not being enforced when they need to be enforced. So, you know, I, I guess that's a little bit of a moot point. Now, Mickey Huff, if, if you've listened to Taboo Table Talk, you'll know that Mickey Huff has been um, a, a guest on the uh, on that program. He he runs Project Censored. Go to projectcensored.com, get the book, read some of their essays, listen to that radio program. Uh, it is, it's all excellent stuff. Uh, Mickey talks a lot about, uh, learning, um, how to analyze corporate media, right? Uh, critical thinking, uh, free thought expression, learning, learning how to kind of decipher how people are talking within the media and things of that sort. So to him, he brings up this thing and I, and I believe this wholeheartedly as well is, if you can learn how the media is used as political propaganda and corporate propaganda and engage in civil discourse, you can get around censorship. So if you disagree with certain ideas and you learn how to, to, to talk about those ideas and learn where those ideas are coming from and you know, what is the source of this idea and go, oh, it's from, it's from Fox News. Hey, let me show you something different. What what about this? Right? You don't need to censor conservative viewpoints. You can engage with them civilly. And 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 that's part of the problem is th when do we report shit and when do we when it becomes over the top, right? When these people are 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 legitimately bothering and harassing you and you got to report them and block them. But if you can engage people in civil discourse and talk to them rationally, and say yes, I'm upset too. I'm very. I did. The, I had to do this the other day. I'm. I'm angry also. But yelling and insulting the other person on this comment thread or this other person on on this social media platform is not going to do us any good when there is a systemic problem in place. And once we look beyond this, well, well, you have a difference of opinion that I don't like, and henceforth it should not be on any sort of platforms. When you get past that, then you can start looking at. What's really going on behind the scenes? Where are they getting this information from? Where are they getting this 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 data from? Oh, is it through corporate media? Oh, is corporate media spinning the data in a particular way that's making it appear as if, you know, immigrants are taking all of the jobs and things of that sort? Oh, is it because they are uh they are they are they're financially destitute and are trying to help their family and don't know how to and they were brought up in this particular type of family household? That has a lot of machismo and hyper. And, OK, well, let's talk to them with that in mind. Now that we know this information, you don't need to call them a piece of shit. You can sit there and say, look, man, I also came from humble beginnings. You know, I went through some of the stuff that you went through. You can actually connect with them because that's what civil discourse does. Civil discourse helps you look beyond just the surface of it. They're conservative. I'm not. Then fuck it. Like it goes beyond all that. But that's what they're afraid of. So before it gets to that point of civil discourse, before it gets to that point where 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 people on the far left and the far right realize, OK, we're not going to agree on everything, but we can agree that there is a systemic problem creating economic uh, economic duress. For for all people within our income bracket. They don't want it to get to that point. So what do they do? They'll go, well, we're going to leave the left alone for now and we'll censor the right. And eventually we'll censor a portion of the left that doesn't work within the, the confines of establishment talking points. But we'll still keep the left away. And then we'll de discredit and delegitimize any other social media platform by saying, oh, look, uh, we, we banned this right wing organization. We banned the, the this 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 far right organization and they moved over to this other platform. We can't. That, that's probably discredited. It's the, the digital oligarchy is 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 literally the 
It's just an online version of what's happening on, on a much larger scale. That's why you shouldn't be championing this sort of censorship. And I believe that it will start getting worse under Joe Biden. Because let me show you some images from Eleanor Goldfield about what this peaceful transition of power looked like. Um, she took some photos that I want to share with you guys. Eleanor Goldfield, Mint Press News article. It's an excellent article. Uh, but look at this. They got pat downs, bulletproof vests, National Guard, which a bunch of National Guard had to be. I mean, this is not. This is what's happening. On the outside, right? Like that's the peaceful transition of power. And yes, I understand why this had to happen. But even people within those organizations were seen as right wing. Uh, they they found you know connections to them talking about the insurrection and support for Trump and stuff. And they weren't allowed to, you know, be a part of the security detail. But where does that come from? Why do so many military people go towards this right wing ideology? I know a bunch of vets that don't. I know a bunch, and then it's like the Boogaloo Boys, right? So let's identify the core. If you really want to solve these problems, you have to identify the core of this. Where does this come from? What is the history of this? What is the psychology of these people? But if you just censor them, they're just going to go back to their holes and it's just going to perpetuate even more. All right, let's look at some comments. I think you guys left a bunch of comments. Uh, Holly, good to see you. Thank you for tuning in. Patriot Act 2.0. Yeah, it, it, that's exactly what it is. It's just, it's just an, an extension of the Patriot Act. Uh, which the you know it, it, which is like this hyper McCarthyist uh, authoritarian bill. Mimi, I completely agree. I think censorship will get much worse under Biden and doubling down on the Patriot Act. Yep, exactly. Uh, yes, Tulsi should have been on the debates. I'm hoping she'll run in 2024 to save us from Buttigieg. <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm a little upset at Tulsi over her Title IX uh, argument. I, I I felt like it was. Um, it was a callous argument and very confusing based on how she has legislated in the past in regards to LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ plus communities. Um, if she runs, she runs. Uh, I'm, I'm also a little disillusioned in terms of supporting candidates right now. Uh, that may or may not change, but I'm not hanging my hat on any candidates. Uh, uh, Graham, Graham Elwood, when she endorsed Biden, Graham Elwood kind of had a very angry video, which was like, OK, cool. I'm glad I'm glad somebody personified exactly what I'm feeling on the inside about Tulsi Gabbard endorsing Joe Biden. Uh, but, you know, if Buttigieg runs, I don't know. I don't know that he will now that he has a, a, a cabinet position. I think the people in the Democratic Party that are that are probably going to make a bid in 2024. Or 2026, I mentioned this in a video uh, earlier this week, is uh, Andrew Cuomo and Gavin Newsom. Those are going to be the two. You're probably going to have Josh Hawley come in to try to take some Trump populists. Um, and and maybe Ted Cruz will run again. Who knows? I don't I don't I don't know uh, uh, in terms of the GOP who they have. Um, regardless, they're all they're all, you know, right wing neoliberals. And uh, I don't I don't know if, if Tulsi the way I think I would support Tulsi again uh, in any shape or form is if she looks at if she if she considers a different solution to what's going on with Title IX and the trans community. Uh, and if she gives a legitimate reason for supporting Joe Biden, other than the fact that, you know, you basically went against everything you said during the campaign. I was a little upset about that. Um, I'm not sure how you feel about Tulsi right now, but again, my my thought was, yeah, she should have been on the debate stage. She was she was an important voice, and I think they took her off the debate stage because I think she would have been a uh, she would have either made Bernie look way better, uh, and she would have challenged Joe Biden to a degree that I don't think he would have been able to come back from. I think he would have gotten flustered with some of the questions. I think he would have gotten flustered by the challenges and probably end up saying something even more vaguely racist than he already has. Um, Jennifer, good to see you. Thank you for tuning in. Divide and conquer is the motto. There's no democracy if we allow 
others with uh if we don't allow others with different opinions absolutely i agree with that wholeheartedly uh we need to learn how to understand differences of opinions where they come from uh and how they're formed and as, again as long as they're not inciting violence and i know that's the that's the direction that it always goes to right is when i make this argument of like yeah no we need to listen to each other we need to talk to people um, but look, if you go and even Klansmen have, have, uh, changed their opinions by talking to black people, um, and listening to what they have to say, uh, a lot of this divide is manufactured divide. Uh, Joe Biden wants to say he's going to be a president for everybody. Well, where I, I listed off a bunch of shit that he could have done to help the working class that he just fucking didn't do um with with executive orders and to to say that he can't do them is is a bunch of bullshit because trump put out a bunch of executive orders so you know and now now you have the senate and the house uh so there's no reason why they can't do the, a lot of the things that they promised us that they will um sorry about the aside there but yeah no i think i think having having a way to learn and talk about different points of view and understand different people's perspectives what what baffles me is people from from my side of things right the minority community whether you are black brown lgbtq uh woman non-binary whatever the, the the minority class of people are the ones calling for the total censorship of the opposition now the opposition do, you know might not like them i know there's a bunch of anti-immigrant people i know there's a bunch of anti-socialist people out there but i don't want them just to disappear off the face of the earth or have be deleted from expressing opinions i you should learn how to engage in those that's part of critical thinking that's part of education that's part of civil discourse we're not going to get a we're not going to become a better society if if we all just merge into our bubbles because now all you're doing is making an argument for separate but equal and that didn't really work uh tyt has gone downhill as well it 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 sure has <laughs> uh it sure has yeah uh tyt has become a very pro-corporate neoliberal uh bullshit news organization uh let me look at a couple more comments they're afraid of uh unity of class yep um joe biden is not looking for no not joe biden uh, quote unquote not joe biden quote uni, unity yeah joe biden's unity is unity for the corporate class that's that's what it is it's not unity for us down here um you know so uh maybe good point about title nine. Oh, when we're talking about tulsi and when she endorsed joe biden that was painful yeah that's that was the thing where i was like i don't know if i'm gonna super endorse candidates anymore and ron put it really well when he did my podcast was you know, uh, I had these views before Tulsi Gabbard came along and Bernie Sanders came along. The reason why we gravitated to them is because they were championing what we believed in. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of the exciting, exciting part of it. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's look at uh, no, no heroes or sheroes. Yes. Um uh, uh, and no, not Cuomo. I know. I wish I wish Cuomo wouldn't be the 2024 candidate, but I do think that he's going to be uh, just because of the amount of press that he's gotten, just because of the amount of um, like people, people love him way fucking too much. Uh, they love him way fucking too much. And he has made way too many headlines. Um, no one challenged Biden. Did you notice? No. Yeah. Uh yeah, no one has challenged Biden yet. No one has tried to push him to the left. AOC hasn't done it. Uh, the squad, as far as my understanding is, they haven't done it either. Uh, he can put an executive order for Medicare for All and UBI. Uh, yes, I. Uh, at the top of this video, uh, we talked about a lot of the executive orders that he can put forward, and Medicare for All is one of them. Uh, Section 1881A of the Social Security Act says that anybody that's been exposed to hazardous materials or dangerous natural disasters uh, can get Medicare for all. And we've all been exposed to the pandemic. So, uh, yeah, that is a reality. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button 
hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor people, uh, un unsubscribe people, and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows, the Forkful of Noodles live virtual comedy shows. Uh, the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website. But if you're also on financial stable ground, you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets and bonus content. And go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to, to make any kind of financial contributions. But if you can't, it's not a necessity. Most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -H -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.